let's give a huge rapturous applause for your 2009 world champion, Mr. Jensen Button. So here we are at your book launch, which, you know, feels very grown up. It does, and it's at Silverstone, which is pretty cool. Very cool, and a great reception, I have to say. Over 600 people here to see you. Just tell us about the process of writing a book, because I have to say, the book was a lot of fun to read. Was it as much fun to write? It was. You know, my, I, I had a book two years ago, which was, you know, the autobiography, um, and it was pretty emotional, you know, all the way through my racing career, and a lot about my dad in it. So that one was very emotional to write. This was very different. It was a lot more fun, tongue in cheek, and you know, it's like the behind the scenes stuff that people wouldn't normally see in Formula One, or it wouldn't be talked about. Um, so it was definitely a lot more fun. Um, and I could have gone on and on and on, but they're like, no, it has to be this length. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more to give still, but uh, it, was, it was really good fun. Um, I also put the, you know, the positives of my career and, and what I learned. And also the negatives, I think you have to put a bit of everything in there. And I think it was important for people to know that I'm going to be very open in the book, um, you know, with, with pretty much everything. It was very chatty. It felt like you were talking directly to your reader, which is a great technique, very sort of endearing. Um, also self-deprecating, as you say, you sort of did take the mickey out of yourself quite a few times. But in terms of the actual sort of format of the book, the way that you would lay things out and then say, summary <laughs> which is quite fun um, uh, what was the sort of thinking behind that just to make it almost more like a journal yeah and I think it makes it a little bit funnier when you have <clears throat> you know the brief summary afterwards and uh, basically I've gone through it and a lot of the stuff is it's really difficult to put into words like explaining how a car feels in a corner and the braking and the turn in and what have you so I was a little bit worried that people are going to go, you know what, that's really boring. So, the, <laughs> so I, was, I was a bit worried. So then they can jump to a bit further on and see the brief summary instead. <laughs> but you did also give a unique insight into life as an F1 driver, because I think certainly from the outside looking in, it seems a certain way. And you were able to show a nice balance. Was that, again, something that you were conscious to do? Uh, yes, I think, you know, being open it's something you can't do when you're uh, still racing in F1, you know, because things are seen as weaknesses. You think things are seen as weaknesses and you think of it as a weakness and you're worried that other drivers are going to use that against you. Um, so you hold everything back uh, when you're racing. So it was a perfect time to let it out. You know, I'm a lot more secure in who I am now than who I, you know, than when I was racing in, in F1. And I think it's the same for a lot of F1 drivers. We have insecurities. You wouldn't think, but we do. Uh, about our ability, um, so it was it was nice to to be really open and show not just other drivers but the people, everyone that reads this book that you know even a Formula One driver can have insecurities and have weaknesses and have things they have to work on and mentally, physically, um, no nobody's immune to that. And if anything, they're probably amplified because they're under the spotlight of the world watching. Yeah, and also I didn't want to forget. You know, I didn't want people to forget the mistakes I've made in my career, you know, because it makes you the person you are now. And I've definitely made a lot of mistakes in my career. Ma you know, whether it's the funny parts, which is buying a yacht, do not buy a yacht, just like throwing money into the ocean, uh, into the sea, or, or things that are a little, you know, a little bit more serious. So I, I, I'm like, you know, having a panic attack, and um, which I had in 2014. Um, I had an injection in my bum because I, I had massive back pain. I'd hurt my back when I was training and I couldn't move. So an injection fainted and then I came round and I was basically blue, came round to the nurses running round in horror really, because they'd never seen that before. Um, and it was a really sort of out of body experience and I could hear things, but I couldn't see things. And, and then after that, I thought I was gonna have a panic attack because it, it took me back to that moment in time and I didn't know how to control it and you just want to get out. Um, a real sort of anxiety attack, I guess. Um, I never fainted, and I never did. I had it for a couple of years while I was racing in F1. Um, and you don't want to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, so I did as much research as I could and found a way of getting over it. You know, I read something that was, you know, when you, when you have a panic attack, it's a massive amount of adrenaline. Um, and you think of it as a negative, but you should try and make it a positive. So like you're on a roller coaster and it's, you're just about to go down on the roller coaster, 
Or for me, it was think about qualifying in Monaco, that adrenaline buzz, and then it put a smile on my face and you learn to breathe and relax. And you know, I think a lot of people have anxiety issues and to, to let people know that anyone can have them and there are so many ways out, I think was, was, was quite important to have that, that in the book. Even world champions. It feels like you have grown up in front of everyone's eyes, you know, in the public eye, which in itself is, is quite a tough thing to do albeit on yachts and in fast cars and beautiful women, but actually documenting it, how useful has that been to you on a personal level? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been more fun than anything else. You know, I think writing my autobiography was pretty special, brought back a lot of emotions. This brings, this makes me smile. The, the, when, I, when I wrote this book, it really made me smile because there's so many bits in there that made me giggle because I had such a good time. Or, I sort of cringe because I'm like, oh no, really? Like leopard print bedding in my motorhome and things like that. So, um, so many memories. And, and obviously we've been touring for a few days doing the book tour uh, with Richard, my manager, and James, my uh, PR man. And there are so many memories coming back and pictures we're showing each other. And it's like, oh no, that really happened. But yeah, it's, it's been really, really good. And, and it's brought back a lot of memories of my my life and things that I shouldn't forget, whether it's good or bad. And how heartened have you been by the response? Because, you know, today alone must give you goosebumps in a way. It does. And, you know, it's always nice when a crowd of your fans or supporters or friends laugh at a joke you tell. But for me, the more, it's more important when you're sitting there telling a story that they're, they're sat there in silence. They're just all listening. There's, there's no you know, there's no talking in the background or whispering to each other. There was just silence and they're listening to you. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really nice feeling. Um, and I hope that I can get the story, I hoped that I could get the story across to them. Um, and they could sort of, for that split second, be in a life of a Formula One driver and, uh, you know, the good and the bad that comes with it. A Formula One driver who has now made that seamless transition into broadcasting, something that you do talk about in the book. How have you found that? Because I know there were times, was a time, when you perhaps didn't think you were going to do it. It didn't feel like the right fit, but you've sort yeah. of grown into that as well. It didn't feel like the right fit when I was still racing in F1. I was like, I'm not going to come back to Formula One. You know, I want to drive. This, that's the reason why I'm here. Uh, and then I was asked to come back for the British Grand Prix. Uh, was it 2017 or 18? Was it 18? No, was it? 17, 17. Was it? And I was so busy that weekend that some of it I enjoyed, but a lot of it, I was just so tired. I was like, oh, my, I'm not sure I can do this. Um, back to racing. Exactly. Uh, and then I, I did another race and I loved it, absolutely loved it. And I think some of it was because I was so nervous the first time, didn't know what to expect. You know, I didn't want to be there like, oh, what questions do I ask? And I didn't want to embarrass myself, I guess. Uh, but now I've, I've definitely got into it more, more confidence with it and, and having a lot of fun with it as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's really, for me, it's great talking to, especially the drivers, because they, most of the guys I raced with. So there's a, bit more, there's, a, there's a bit of a rapport there. And you, know, you can see the little twinkle in their eyes when you're asking them a tricky question. But they give me the answer, which is nice. They have responded really well to you. Uh, does that surprise you in a way? Do you think they would be a bit more guarded? Because they, they know really that you know the answer that they're about to give. They can't pull yeah. the wool over your eyes. No, they can't. Uh, and it was funny, the first time I interviewed the drivers, uh, for example, Lewis or Sebastian, the first time I looked at them in the eyes and had the microphone, you could see they had a little smile on their face and it was slightly uncomfortable. But now it's great, you know, and they know that I, I know which answer that they should be giving. <laughs> but it's always interesting to hear the one that they do give. Exactly, the, the rehearsed one. Uh, final question from me. How on earth did you fail your driving test? <laughs> I love this bit of the book. Yeah. This, this well, made me laugh. I've been told that they can only pass a certain amount of people a week. Right. Right. And I was That's at the end of the week, so they had to fail me, even though I was probably the best. It's probably the bestest. I think, well, I heard, it's because you were a bit cocky. I probably was. I was confident. So I'd, I basically went for a gap that wasn't there, so, yeah. Um, but I passed my first driving test in the States which was good. It was six minutes, and I think I could have done it with an eye closed. I think anybody can pass their tests in the States. Very easy. And looking at some of the driving in the States, yes, it's very easy to pass your test. 
How on earth did the instructor feel about a world champion sitting a driving test? Well, he didn't know. They haven't got a clue who you were. No. But didn't they ask you? They did. They said to you, what do you do for a living? I said I'm a driver. Yeah. And I think he thought I was UPS or, or, uh, or an Uber driver. I don't think he realised that I was a racing driver. And then I explained to him. Um, and then he texted me after and he checked it out online. He's like, I didn't realise I had a world champion in the car. And very sweet. And it was an old Honda Accord from 2006 or something, I think. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a lovely experience, and, and to be fair, it's really nice, very refreshing being in, in the States um, and, and doing a driving test, because no one's got a clue who I am, so I can relax and just worry about failing <laughs> or passing.